The left has lost its cool. It used to be punk rock, the counterculture, and have figures like Gil Scott Heron, the Dead Kennedys, Public Enemy. What's cool nowadays? Oh good god. Conservatism. Ben Shapiro. Jordan Peterson. Well here's a philosopher's take on what people like Shapiro and Peterson have to offer. I don't mean to offend when I make this video, if anything I'm accepting their invitation to rational debate. This isn't like one of my normal videos where I take every opportunity to be snarky and sarcastic, I'm accepting this invitation in good faith. My goal here is not to defame or insult Peterson and Shapiro, and I wholeheartedly invite anyone to come back against me with their arguments. If anything, this video is aimed at the Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro fans. Why? Because I'm hoping to show you that rational, civil, educated argument exists on the left, and that it's all too easy to fall into the trap of mistaking conviction for argument. I'm not saying that the left has absolved itself of this sin, but Peterson and Shapiro have amassed a following that want to be free thinkers. If this is you, try criticising them. Hold your heroes to the same standard you would anyone else. They're obviously on the political right, though Peterson describes himself as a British classical liberal. I do want to make a another video about how these terms, conservative, classical liberal, have lost their meaning. Both of them have ascended to fame rather quickly because of their takedown style of argument and ability to look really clever. I would want to speak about Milo Yiannopoulos as well, but I think his 15 minutes are coming to an end for one, and he really isn't the same as Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro for another. I'm not the first person to make a video on this subject. In fact, I'd send you in the way of ContraPoints videos. She does a far better job than I will, I'm sure. However, my approach is slightly different. She defended postmodernism in her video, but my philosophic convictions are very different to hers. More often than not, I believe whatever problem we're facing today isn't a new one at all. And nothing more is true in the case of these two. So let's go back in time a bit, by which I mean to the 4th century BCE. Plato writes his dialogue Gorgias. Gorgias is a sophist, a public speaker and a teacher who specialises in rhetoric, and his speeches. He professes to do the same thing as Socrates, philosophy, but Socrates has none of it. Socrates is certainly right here. Rhetoric, Socrates holds, is a skill. That's something you improve through experience and employ as a means to an end. He contrasts this to philosophy, something that is, to Socrates, an end in itself. He calls philosophy an art, which is autotelic, uh, has its purpose in itself. However, the view Plato then goes on to advance is even more critical of the sophists. He argues that the end of sophistry, what it's designed for, is to create belief, not knowledge. So long as people walk away believing what the sophist wants them to, the sophist has succeeded. The end of philosophy, on the other hand, is knowledge. He also gets Gorgias to admit that the sophist has far more appeal to someone without expertise. That is to say, anyone who knows what they're on about isn't going to be had by sophistry. Socrates draws a distinction between knowledge and opinion. It's impossible to know a falsehood, while it is possible to believe one. Therefore, claims Socrates, that falsehood is part of the trade of sophistry. The distinction isn't without contention. Lots of philosophers have described knowledge as a, sub a subset of belief. The current tradition certainly doesn't fall under this category. My opinion on Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro should then become clear. Especially given two recent events, this is clear to see. The debate Peterson had with Slavoj Žižek and Ben Shapiro's interview with Andrew Neil both expose them as the sophists I claim them to be. I'll start with Ben Shapiro. He's clearly so used to debating the centre-left college students, calling Bernie Sanders a socialist and so on, that anyone like Andrew Neil is a bit unexpected. Embarrassingly, he called Andrew Neil a left-winger, and for anyone living in Britain, as you might guess I do, this is deeply wrong. Neil Back's pseudoscientific claims about climate change, HIV and AIDS is basically a tool of Murdoch's news corporation, a chicken hawk, has supported Holocaust deniers, he makes speeches in support of Friedrich Hayek and the Adam Smith Institute, though Adam Smith would have hated to see what neoliberalism is. I don't know what this man is other than on the right wing, and firmly so. 
Ben Shapiro wants to establish beliefs in anti-feminism, anti-social democrat policies, and employs the facts as and when it suits him. As for the logic of his arguments, I don't think it comes into it. Logic is thrown about as if it's the same thing as reason, which is it isn't. Logic is about the study of the relationship between premises and consequences of an argument. It's a little besides the point, but I hold Ben to be neither reasonable nor logical. Many of his arguments, certainly in the in what I've read of him, are purely ad hominem, or straightforward Americanism. I'd accuse someone like Dennis Prager of the same thing, but I've been told that that would be picking an easy fight. Three Arrows and Sean have dealt with that issue pretty thoroughly on their own. Something to note about Ben Shapiro is that he is really good at this. He can't critically evaluate, sure, but god can he talk. He's fast, he's sharp, and he's vocal, the three things that make for a good sophist. Philosophy, in contrast, is not fast. It isn't a fast-paced debate at all. It is a slow, analytical discipline that is pedantic about each and every detail. With that in mind, I suppose I should subject Ben Shapiro to the standards one would a good philosopher. Let's look at some arguments here. There's a crisis of meaning that is happening among young people. That crisis of meaning is directly related to loss of religion in the United States. There is no doubt about this. Okay, the suicide rates have tripled among young people in the United States between 2006 and 2016. There's a reason for this. Right now, young American children growing up in the freest, most prosperous country in the history of mankind are killing themselves at record rates. And this is happening for a very specific reason. It is happening because we are not providing them meaning. And I, mean, I don't mean the people in this room, really, because I think all of us spend our lives trying to figure out how we provide that meaning for our kids. I mean, our culture is militantly opposed to us providing that meaning for our children. They're supposed to find meaning in whatever the social justice buzzword of the day is. They're supposed to find meaning in the idea that they get to define their own meaning, that their morality is above God's morality, that there is no transcendent truth, there is just the truth that's inside of you, there's just your truth. Well, guess what? Human beings suck at finding their truth. Because as all religious people know, there is a difference between your truth, which is just called what you're feeling like today, and the truth, which has nothing to do with you and comes from a higher place. This is a great example of what I'm saying, though I assure you not the only example. Ben Shapiro's twisting language brilliantly to make uh, what is meant unclear. Saying that there is no doubt about something doesn't mean that there isn't any doubt about something. It's an expression of conviction, and I don't doubt for a moment that Ben is full of conviction. There could be any number of possible explanations for this phenomenon. There's certainly a link between this and the culture of inadequacy that's been bred over the last four decades especially. We aren't providing the meaning, is just a meaningless statement. What meaning is there to life? Supposed to find meaning in the social justice buzzword? I'd like an example of this because I don't think that anyone thinks I can't achieve equality or justice and so on so there's no meaning in life so I will commit suicide. That's essentially Ben's argument. Furthermore, if his implicit premise were true, religion provides meaning to life, we wouldn't see Russia, where 70% of people are orthodox Christian, having the third highest suicide rate in the world. It would also imply that all suicides in America are committed by atheists. This is really quickly becoming nonsensical, while sounding very clever to begin with. Furthermore, no one is claiming that there is no transcendent truth. They're claiming that there is no universal meaning to life. God's morality is itself a vague term as well. I'd like to respond to the claim that God's morality exists with another example from Plato, the Euthyphro Dilemma. Is God's command moral because 1. He only ever commands what is moral, or 2. Because whatever he commands is moral by virtue of it being his command? 1. Implies that there is a moral law independent of God, and therefore it is wholly possible to be moral and an atheist, so long as you follow the moral law. 2. Implies that whatever God is, says is moral. Defenders of 2 would hold that Abraham was right to try to kill Isaac. But then do they run into the problem of, unless spoken directly to by God, how do we know what is moral? So further reflection on a throwaway phrase, like God's morality, leaves us severely wanting. What does Ben mean? And I think your guess is as good as mine. So just because he sounds confident doesn't mean he knows what he's on about at all. I guess it's now worth mentioning the interview with Andrew Neil. 
He claims that the media bias is a leftist one, which I find absolutely hilarious. I'd recommend reading something like Manufacturing Consent or Propaganda Blitz. I think Ben is the kind of person who'd see RNHS as a radical leftist structure, which I think is a view that is peculiar to America. I think if you look at someone like Jeremy Corbyn, his positions in the US would be seen as bon bordering on Menshevism, in the UK he's seen as on the hard left. In Europe he'd be seen as a moderate social democrat. Andrew Neil also picks up on the abortion laws, to which Ben Shapiro accuses Neil of being unobjective un and a leftist. Ben is used to debating college students, that clarifying his own position is so out of his depth. Undermining the opposition in, is his primary tactic here, and he switches to it wherever possible. It's sophistry at, at its finest, play offence more than defence. And this happens again and again. And while it would pain me deeply to say about any other subject Andrew Neil has spoken about, he's absolutely right with Ben Shapiro. Ben isn't as interested in civil discourse as he claims to be, but rather constant destruction of his opposition, even if he doesn't call it that. The arguments are completely steamrolling the opposition, not carefully considering what is being claimed. Ben describes fascistic mentalities. I think here he's doing exactly what he accuses the left of, calling anything they don't like fascists. Why do people do this? It's such a charged word, of course. Anything and everything is, that is described as fascist ought to be opposed, we think. Nothing breeds opinion as quickly as conviction, and there is certainly conviction, as there ought to be, against fascism. So here again, the aim isn't to get people to know something true, rather just to believe something. I'm not trying to say that by virtue of this Ben Shapiro is a hack, I'm trying to say that truth isn't part of the agenda. As a philosopher, truth has to be the desideratum in some sense at least, otherwise all bets are off. Ben Shapiro's tactics have been discussed frequently already. Debate people are easy to debate, talk quickly and confidently, relentlessly push the view that all left-wingers have to contribute is some spew of moralising emotional value judgments. I won't touch on his arguments against social democracy, what he calls socialism, here at all. I just want to point out again that the moment he debates anyone else, or indeed is interviewed by, the bravery is shown to be naught but bravado. I'll come back to Shapiro after discussing Jordan Peterson, because both of them will operate under the free speech hat. What they're saying isn't free speech, uh, isn't hate speech, according to them, it's just free speech. And the left supposedly wants to take that away. I'm happy to discuss this, and in great detail too. It should be worth noting that I live in a country in which free speech does not include hate speech. The United Kingdom, I assure you, is not run by leftist tyrants or Marxist dictators. I'll speak about this in a moment. Jordan Peterson has been somewhat of an intellectual nit to pick for me for a little while now, and I must admit that he is the primary subject of, his, if, of this video. He irritates me greatly because of what I've said about Ben Shapiro, but also so much more. His anti-intellectualism and frankly high school level understanding of Marxism and socialism bit him hard in his debate with Slavoj Žižek. There's a number of things he says that make him sound intellectually honest, but I'd like to point out how far off they are just as examples of his faux high ground. His opposition to the left wing originates with the attack on free speech in Canada, after Canada legislated that transgender people should be called by their preferred pronouns, he started a moral crusade against the postmodern neo-Marxists who want to enforce a Stalinist pronoun usage policy. I'm saying this deadpan, but I assure you that I find this very difficult to take seriously. There is no such thing as a postmodern neo-Marxist. Postmodernists can be on the left wing for sure, but Marxism is a modernist theory and must remain so. Neo-Marxism is such a vaguely defined term that it can be used to refer to a range of thought from libertarian socialism, and before anyone says that that's a contradiction in terms, it doesn't have to be. I might make another video about this. Um, from that to existentialist anarchism. It's pretty much impossible to pin down, and I would refrain from using the word altogether because of how vague it is. As for postmodernism, I am in one way aligned with Jordan Peterson on this issue. I don't think postmodernism has a role to play in philosophy or the sciences, particularly after instances like the Sokol Affair or the Chomsky-Foucault debate. 
However, feminism and socialism are not postmodernist ideas, and you don't have to be a right winger to address postmodernist issues. In fact, the most fervent critics of postmodernism I've seen come from the left wing. My own view is that postmodernism is an aberration in philosophical tradition. Noam Chomsky's view certainly reflects my own. He asks, seriously, what are the principles of their theories? On what evidence are they based? What do they explain that wasn't already obvious? These are fair requests for anyone to make. If they can't be met, I suggest recourse to Hume's advice in similar situations. To the flames. End quote. David Hume suggested that all true propositions are either conclusions of logical or mathematical derivation and argument, or they are simply truths of observation, matters of empirical facts. Everything else is sophistry and illusion, and should be consequently committed to the flames. This is a standard I try and apply to all intellectual inquiry, and I think it is essentially correct. My question is whether Peterson can meet the same standards, despite his claims against postmodernism. Obviously, much of what he claims with respect to Christianity and God is bizarre and spiritual, and wouldn't meet these standards, but I'm less interested in that than the political issues. No, that wasn't real Marxism. I know what that means. I know what that sentence means. What that means is, well, if I was the dictator, with my profound understanding of Marx's real intent, and my universal benevolent compassion, uncontaminated by any proclivity towards darkness or sin, I would bring on the socialist utopia. That's what it means, fundamentally. And if someone says that and claims it, then you should get the hell away from them as fast as you possibly can. Peterson claims that the statement, the USSR was not socialist, translates to, if I was in Stalin's position, I'd have done differently, for example. I don't think this is even remotely true, and a brief foray into history demonstrates that undeniably. What happened in the Russian Revolution was initially socialist, in that it was run by autonomous workers' councils. The very meaning of the word Soviet is council. The Bolsheviks initially demanded that these Soviets be empowered, they said all power to the councils, uh, so that workers could have control of industry. Lenin then changed his mind uh, when he didn't get the vote, saying that sometimes a step backwards is necessary for two steps forward, and dismantled the Soviets in favour of total state control. The germs of socialism in the form of workers' councils were crushed by the Bolshevik regime in favour of a totalitarian system that scarcely anyone would dare support now. There are volumes about the failures of the USSR, many from left-wingers too. I suggest reading those above abstract criticisms like those posed by Jordan Peterson. So some of what he has to say has already failed to meet the basic criteria of Hume's fork. The claim that if I were in Stalin's position, so on, has neither argument nor facts to support it. In fact, the idea that socialism wasn't supported but dismantled by the Bolsheviks is simply a matter of fact. Reading into Lenin's new economic policy, or the NEP, demonstrates that. The Soviet Union saw itself as capitalist. However, Peterson says all this with conviction, and again I will make this clear. My aim in this video is simply to point out how the right often says something with great conviction, but this should not be mistaken for argument. Jordan Peterson's fundamental political thesis is that inequality is a natural law of life, and that it is better for us to accept hierarchies than to try and dismantle them, as this will consistently end in failure. He claims that the Western systems are the only systems that have managed to add wealth to this inequality. The claim that hierarchy is a necessary part of society I accept with far more conservatism than Peterson. Sure, hierarchy and inequality are inevitable, but the question he avoids is to what extent they are. Peterson claims that this might even be expressible in a mathematical form. There's probably a rule that's something like, in order to produce one increment of absolute wealth, you have to allow three increments of inequality or something like that. Inequality is the price you pay for the generation of wealth. And I suspect because the right amount of inequality the right amount of inequality is not zero, it's some number. Hume's demands need to be fulfilled still. I'm not buying this argument and neither do economists. 
Nobel Prize winning economists say that inequality is harmful to society for a number of reasons and we would do well to act on it better than we are now. I would recommend Joseph Stiglitz, The Great Divide or The Price of Inequality. There are any number of examples of more democratic, that is to say less hierarchical societies than ours, and I don't see anything in many socialist propos proposals that would contravene these. For example, workplace democracy or a reduction in independence in wage labour. Increased welfare isn't going to reduce hierarchy, uh, hierarchy significantly, but it will improve people's lives. In fact, universal basic income was originally a right-wing proposal by the darling of many a neoconservative, Milton Friedman. I agree that a hierarchical structure is necessary, but he's very vague about what he means by this, and I think intentionally. I don't think anyone sensible is saying to dismantle all hierarchies, even the anarcho-syndicalists in Spain, for instance, had hierarchically organized unions. They also ran them democratically as far as possible and had a society that was pluralist, effective, and also relatively equitable. And one thing uh, Peterson definitely gets wrong is that Marxism doesn't claim to know how to fix these problems. In fact, what Marx says about socialism is scattered and slight. He is a theorist not of socialism, but a critic of capitalism, and many of his criticisms of capitalism are held in high regard by economists today. I don't claim for one moment that he got everything right, but I would be loath to claim that he was a moron who had nothing worthwhile to say. In fact, I think conservatives and Marx have a lot in common. Marx wasn't an egalitarian at all. In fact, he was explicitly anti-equality. This is something Peterson would know if he had read any more Marx than the manifesto. The critique of the Gotha program is a great short introduction to what Marxism is, especially as distinct from the centre-left people think it's about. I hope that people interested in rational debate read and critique it, but also find something in there that's worth paying attention to. Jordan Peterson presents his argument with conviction and a barrage of facts, but they're all variations on the straw man. Very rarely do the facts actually support his underlying premises. His arguments rely on boogeymen and vaguely defined terms. It's really easy to agree with Jordan Peterson's premises. Uh, for example, hierarchy being necessary, the Soviet Union being a failure, and so on, but his conclusions simply don't follow. Conviction is an argument, and Peterson has conviction in barrels. His arguments don't meet the standards posed by Hume, and I think it really is fair enough that anything worth listening to does. Again, I'm not saying that everything on the left meets those standards either. I'm saying that you can criticize the social justice movement, you can criticize socialism, you can criticize feminism, and still be aligned with these things. In fact, debate is healthy, and the kind of behavior I've just described is probably the category I'd fall into. Rational debate can exist on the left, and does exist on the left. If anyone disagrees, I'm happy to take you up on that. One other claim that Jordan Peterson makes frequently that I find really quite baffling is that the Marxists are demanding equality of outcome and that's why they should be opposed. That's what leads them to be totalitarian. This isn't a Marxist concept whatsoever. In fact, it goes back to Aristotle who demands it in the first few chapters of The Politics. He talks about how we can't have a real democracy unless we have equality of outcome. And that unless we do, Society is in a permanently unstable state. So, what I'm saying is, looking further into these ideas shows that the facts, the arguments, support something very different to what Peterson says, and it might even be surprising to you. But the debate has been defended by Peterson and Shapiro under the guise of free speech. Free speech and freedom of the press has had an interesting philosophical development, starting really with John Milton's 1644 track Areopagitica, a short work worth reading that I agree with in pretty much all cases. However, you have to ask whether these convictions are 1. not shared by those on the left, and 2. genuinely held by Peterson and Shapiro. I'll address both inquiries in turn. One, I think, is demonstrably false. However, I am wary of claiming that the left-wing is one single monolithic entity. I'll elaborate. There are some left-wingers, notably Noam Chomsky, who think freedom of speech should be wholly advocated, even for Nazis, Holocaust deniers, racists, so on, because freedom of speech means believing in it for everyone. George Orwell was of a similar slant. 
though it's often conveniently forgotten that he was a very committed socialist that fought for the Marxist militia in the Spanish Civil War, and was proud to have done so. So being left-wing doesn't entail skepticism of the right to freedom of speech. It is also worth noting that in the books I mentioned earlier, Manufacturing Consent and Propaganda Blitz, it is suggested that the media has a centrist, not a leftist bias. Left-wing ideas actually suffer the most under the loss of freedom of speech. What we're seeing with Bill 16, uh, C-16, and so on isn't socialism, it's rainbow capitalism. Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson will play the free speech card, and this is in response to point number two, as and when it suits them. But surely calling for people to use their pronouns counts as free speech. If not, then they're saying that calling for restrictions to freedom of speech doesn't count as freedom of speech. If this is the case, then Nazis and other totalitarians do not enjoy the right either. It may be raised that they're only opposed to restrictions in legislation. Living in a country where this is the case, it hasn't led to tyranny. In fact, homophobic and transphobic crime is on the rise in Britain. Um, but this is besides the point. Ben Shapiro has criticised Google, which is not a socialist organisation, for firing an employee after hate comments against women. Firstly, is this not telling a private corporation what to do with their business and against his own principles? Secondly, both Peterson and Shapiro have sued one institution or another for defamation. I don't think defamation counts as free speech, but by their absolutist standards of free speech, it should. It seems to be something they support when it suits them, rather than something they genuinely believe in. This just leaves us in a huge quagmire about what these individuals believe. But like I said, I'm not trying to say, stop liking what I don't like, with regards to Shapiro and Peterson. I'm trying to meet the challenge of debate posed by these conservatives in a manner perhaps unexpected of the left. I would like to extend an invitation to people who agree with Peterson and Shapiro to debate in good faith, to explore leftist literature and ideas, and not to dismiss leftism as being an emotional, overly emotional crybaby. If I'm wrong in anything I've said so far, I'm happy to hear it. If I'm right, perhaps reconsidering your views is worth it, and I'm all too happy to have helped with that. I think that a lot of the concerns raised by Peterson and Shapiro are valid, and that we don't need to sort our lives out in a superficial, but a fundamental way. I think the left is organising to tackle the problems behind uh, this meaninglessness. Jobs, for example, are meaningless and people want to participate in more fulfilling work, for example. I think that a lot of the criticism of the left is valid, particularly group identity over pragmatism. I would argue that a lot of classically liberal ideas, the ones that Peterson and Shapiro claim to have, would lead to an anarchist or a left-wing communist thinking, and that's not the same as being left-wing or being a communist, being a left communist is its own thing. Perhaps it's worth looking more into these ideas. You might even find the same thing you were looking for in Peterson and Shapiro, but in light of what I've just said, differently organised and with completely different conclusions. However, all this being said, I'm happy to hear any criticisms of what I've said and hope that you afford the same respect you would to any advocate of free speech.